Professor David Ralph. I work in London at the University College. The only way you can build anything, you're not going to build it on your own. You have to appoint good people. You're not going to appoint people that aren't going to cause any problems. You have to appoint people who you think are going to make the unit better. So good to meet you, sir, in Saudi Arabia, Riyadh. Could you please introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Professor David Ralph. I work in London at the University College. Uh, I've been a urologist uh, for almost 30 years now, and I specialize in the field of andrology, so that's male sexual dysfunction, penile reconstruction, and male infertility. So, as we all know, you have successfully grown and uh, established andrology in London and I guess all over the UK. So, may I ask how, why did you start to work as andrology in the first place? I was training as a, as a urologist like we did uh, 30 years ago and as part of the training one had to do a year's worth of research and so I was hunting around trying to find out what project I could do and I happened to stumble against uh, uh, to my mentor uh, John Pryor who said oh I have a project on Peyronie's disease and if you want you can do that so I said okay fine I went and found out what Peyronie's disease was and mm -hmm. that's what I was going to do so I did that for a year mm -hmm. uh, both in the lab I got a higher degree in, 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 in Peyronie's disease and um, usually what happens th is that the research that you do, you spend so much time, you become known in the field, and then eventually I was the andrologist, uh, ah. particularly when John retired mm. uh, a few years later. Mm. When I went to, the, uh, went to get a training from you in the London, I was able to see you created a huge, almost gigantic uh, uh, a practice which involves a lot of fields. Every field of andrology, I'll say, yeah. and also you have a whole lot of crowds all over the world. It, it is it's quite satisfying to see uh, the department grow because I mean I started 1996 as a consultant and it was just myself uh, and then I managed to get a nurse practitioner and in the field of erectile dysfunction, anything to do with andrology the patients suddenly keep coming and coming and I was finding that I couldn't cope and so I needed a colleague and so the hospital realized that that was the case and so they gave me a colleague and what happens in andrology is there's an endless number of patients <laughs> and so even though you have a colleague that colleague makes just as much work and so you need another colleague and so it it, 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 it went like that and so currently we have six andrologists in UCL and because there's six of us we, we then said well we can't all just be general andrologist, mm -hmm. why don't we sub-specialize, so I mean, we do all, all do everything, mm -hmm. one's doing main of fertility, mm -hmm. one or two are now doing penile cancer, one's doing phalloplasty, and I'm doing obviously the, the penile implants, mm -hmm. peronies, That's what we do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, we also do gender reassignment, and, and we have six full-time consultants, uh, we now have eight clinical fellows, <laughs> two nurses, and you can see that it's actually becoming quite a, a, a big department in its in its own right. I felt like it's a kingdom, <laughs> well, a whole lot of difference of in, in terms of andrology. I, I, you've got this big department, but there's still a wait to see us. <laughs> I guess you know success brings success, and um, it's nice to see because obviously you have to throw the gauntlet down, and someone else will have to take this up, and hopefully uh, we will continue expanding. What I wanted to ask you is that not every surgeon are like yourself. For example, there are many surgeons who I call as a infertile in terms of offsprings. Not the children, but the, their colleagues, I'll say. They do not tolerate well with the colleagues. Uh, as a surgeon, you know, we want uh, perfection. How yeah. were you able to overcome that and train? I saw you how trained the other trainees. You let them do the surgery, even though you know, trainees are not as good as you, but you are letting them learn the... I've always, uh, I mean, obviously there's confrontation between colleagues, but 
at the end of the day, the only way you can build anything, you're not going to build it on your own. Uh, you have to uh, uh, appoint good people. You're not going to appoint people that aren't going to cause any problems. You have to appoint people who you think are going to make the unit better. I think we must have trained in the UK 30 or 40 uh, separate andrologists who then gone out to the different areas and set up their own practice. For example, Scotland will say, well, we haven't got any, so we have trained someone who we know is going to go to Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and all different parts of the country. Uh, because it's much easier if you know someone is coming from an area and they're going to go back to that area once they've been trained because they can't all stay in London. Mm -hmm. But um, so we get lots of referrals from from all areas of the country but of course the more you train people they can then do the cases themselves and so you get less <laughs> referrals but you know as I said andrology is a field where there's just a, you're never short of patients um, and be it private patients or NHS patients don't worry about it um, if you're good and you have a good service the patients will find you I guess that's the key, you know, you, as you are providing patient a good service, that's why you have an endless patience. Because, uh, as you know, I, I need a lot of education, so I travel several other countries and saw, seen many other surgeons. But not everybody was speaking the way you said, the, the way you just oh. like you mentioned. Oh, so yeah. they are lack of the patient, they are crying for more cases, but uh, I believe I totally agree with you. Over the years I have seen, it is the patient who decides where to go. And if they know that if the surgeon is trustworthy, they will always come, yeah. come to you and uh, get the proper service. Yeah. So I guess when I was sitting, sitting at your uh, outpatient uh, office, I was able to feel the patient was referred and I don't trust that you don't have a, enough referrals because I was able to see a lot of referrals from the other surgeons who trust you. Yeah. And the, the patient had a complete trust of your presence. I think, I think you have to develop a, a doctor-patient relationship. Um, I think you have to be kind to the patient. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of doctors, you know, when they're just not in I mean you've got to be interested so mm. if you're a general urologist and someone comes in with erectile dysfunction you know you're not as interested perhaps and, mm. um, and I think the more interested you are in a subject then obviously the patient realizes that you can just relate to them pretty quick you know what their problems are mm. and how they're feeling because mm. you know it's all areas there's a lot of psychology in, in mm. andrology uh, and I know what I know what issues they're concerned about. Mm -hmm.